Um, the president is talking about mitigating the side effect of negative rates. Does that mean tiering is coming? I think it's, it's a bit premature, I think, to, to, to take that conclusion. What is clear now is that the perspective of low rates for longer has triggered that debate about the side effects of uh, negative rates. So I think it's fair to say that this uh, issue has to be anal analyzed uh, carefully. Uh, but you need, in any case, to find a monetary policy case. You cannot just conclude, you know, let's do the tiering because the economy is slowing down and the rates are low for longer. Uh, so I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, we have to go into this issue, uh, but we need to have a convincing monetary policy case to do that. Now, when you look at the economy today and the lending channel, uh, we don't see any particular problem in the lending channel today. But as we know, with the weakening economy, it may happen in the future. So you have to be ready and to look at the possible instruments or sort of decisions you may need to take in case. Uh, so readiness, yes, but I think uh, don't rush too quickly into conclusions. But uh, it's fair to say that the conversation can, is started. Has started. Does it, if the conversation has started, does it mean that interest rates will stay low for even longer? I think it's difficult to say today. I mean, when you look at uh, prices, you know, uh, market prices, yes, I mean, the date of the first liftoff has been pushed further by market participants, and so this debate on the tiering has been coming. Uh, as I say, uh, the uh, perspectives of rate for longer is something you have to look at all the consequences of that. Does it's a repetition, by the way. Yeah, but, um, Does tiering make the tool of negative interest rates less effective? The negative rates have been extremely useful to support the economy, basically because uh, the opportunity cost you know, of saving has been lower. So you push people either to spend or to go into risk, you know, more risk, and supporting the economy, uh, going into investment and all that. So we have been big effects of the negative rates on the economy, which is good also for the banks themselves, because if the customers do better, it's also good for them. The question that comes today is that with a slowing economy, because of international and geopolitical factors, uh, you get lower growth and you get also the negative effect of the rate situation on the intermediation margin. And that's how the debate has been triggered. Now, uh, on the economy, you have to see how the things will evolve. But, I mean, that's, for, that's for the next question, of course. Now, German bonds are yielding negative. Um, is that a red flag for the ECB? Well, it, it reflects concerns because uh, basically uh, our policy has not, communication has not changed uh, recently. I mean, we have this uh, forward guidance which basically says that the rates are going to stay at present level until, you know, through the end of the year. Uh, but uh, the recent, uh, you know, uh, increase of boon prices, you know, where the spreads, uh, where the, the rates really fell to zero or even negative rates reflects uh, concerns in the market at some flight to safety. Uh, and so they reflect a concern about the economy in general, yes. So it's an indication of, uh, of uncertainties in the market, yes. Are you particularly concerned about Germany? I'm uh, not particularly concerned about Germany. I think uh, balance sheets in general uh, of NFCs, non-financial corporations, of households and of the state actually are in good shape. So I think this is a country that can, uh, you know, absorbed a number of shocks. Of course, on the other side, the German economy is very much depending on manufacturing. As we know that manufacturing has been really hit by the international uncertainties related to protectionism and also the slowdown in China and also the UK. One has to say that in the UK there has been a visible slowdown of investment, so the investment has come to a halt. And uh, Germany, of course, is a big exporter of investment goods, equipment goods, and Germany has been hit uh, already today by the, the sort of Brexit-related uncertainties. Uh, and so, yes, I think the country is resilient. On the other hand, they're exposed to manufacturing. I think they can go through, but it's, of course, a, a more delicate you know, phase in, in, in the business cycle for them. What about Italy? Italy is another case. Uh, it's a different case. Italy is weak since long time. So Italy has a number of recessions before. You know, they had, a, I would say, three recessions. They have a new recession now. Uh, I think it's a difficult case where you need, uh, you need uh, really uh, more structural reforms, of course, but that's a different sort of situation. Um, talk to me about risks. Um, there's China, there is trade. You mentioned Brexit. Yeah. What is your biggest concern? Well, the, the concerns in general are from, of political nature. I think the, uh, 
the uh, persistent character of all of these uncertainties, and, and, and you listed a number of uncertainties, uh, are weighing you know, on, on economic sentiment and business sentiment in general. So you can say it's only you know, for the persistence of these uncertainties at some point you know, have real effects. You know. For a time, you know, business continue their investment plans and sort of business as usual, but at some point it hits confidence and has real effects. So that worries me indeed. It's about time that we reduce a little bit this uncertainty. Uh, political uncertainty. What can the ECB do to do that? Well, I mean, there is only so much uh, the central bank can do. So we have a mandate which is price stability. So we use the instruments we think, you know, are the best tutored to reach our objective. But it's only, you know, limited, you know, if you get fundamental uncertainties related, for example, to the trade regime, you know, and the Brexit related problems. I mean, the central bank cannot do much about this. So it also needs to be supported by other policies in general. You have anything specific in mind? Um, any, any well, I think it's time that this uh, British, you know, that this Brexit ends, you know, in I hope in a satisfactory and orderly way. Uh, that would probably restore confidence qu quickly. I mean, if you do it in an orderly way, it could be the other way. But I mean, these things, I mean, really sends very, very negative signals, you know, uh, in uh, for you know everybody. I mean, uh, to say, you know, how is it possible to have so much uncertainties lasting so long about that issue? And uh, I mean, that's one example. There are other examples, you know, in the, in the trade sphere. It would be, uh, of course, very good for confidence if, uh, you know, the, the trade negotiations between US, China, you know, end in a satisfactory way. Also, we have uncertainties about the trade regime, Europe vis-a-vis -vis the US. So <coughs> these uncertainties really uh, then confidence, you know, have an impact on confidence. And uh, that's the worry. At the ECB, you've been working on a new lending program, and I want to talk to you about timing. The announcement of the program came a lot sooner than many people expected. The start of the program will be somewhat later than people expected. Why is that? Well, I mean, um, the uh, what we call the TELTRO, the Funding Fund Lending, have, uh, is a very flexible instrument, and there are many parameters in that instrument. The uh, What we have decided in the Governing Council is to disclose some of the parameters. First, for, first is the TELTRO is available. That means it's a basically a funding instrument. You know, we, uh, borrowers, you know, banks will be able to borrow two years, up to two years, from, two years, two years from now. So this is a funding side. It basically responds to the uh, concerns that we have about congestions on the bond market linked to two cliffs effect. One cliff effect would be in June of next year, the other March of the following year. So that we have addressed. The other issue with the Teltro is to what extent do you want to use it as an instrument to support lending conditions? And that's the incentive scheme that you need to put in place. That's premature because you want to have more clarity about uh, the evolution of the economy and the lending parts you know, uh, that supports the economy. For the time being now, we don't see anything special in terms of lending, banking intermediation to non-financial corporations or for households. So things are okay on that side. Of course, a bank, uh, central bank has to look preemptively, has to look how the situation potentially will evolve. And with the weakening of the economic growth, you can, you know, you must be ready uh, to, be, uh, to act the instruments needed, you know, if you want to support lending. I, I, I would say in terms of pricing for the Teltro, you want to uh, first to make an assessment. Uh, what is the pricing that corresponds, you know, the best to the problem you want to address? So if it's lower lending at that time, the pricing have to take that into account. It's a bit premature now, so we're going to decide in due time, as we say. Can you translate due time? Well, How much time do you have? <coughs> the first allotment would be uh, in September of this year, so you have to do it before. Uh, so that will be decided, maybe, I don't know, but maybe when I will be gone, you know, that means for the Governing Council of June, because we also will have the projections at that time. So that would be one opportunity before September. But this being said, you can always, uh, the Governing Council can always decide to change the incentive scheme of a program. We did it in the past, you know, given the evolution of the economy, we can do it in the future. As I said, it's a very flexible instrument, so you can do that. But it, it must be adapted, you know, the, the pro the, to the problem you want to address, which is a monetary policy issue that you, that you have to have in consideration. You've talked to the banks uh, about this tool in the past. Do you have any idea about take-up? What's your estimate? Well, you see, the, the banks, uh, the, the Teltro 2 
is extremely uh, advantageous for banks because they can borrow money at minus 40 basis points. So there is still a maturity of about one year. So there is no incentive to go in a new one for a bank that could borrow at minus 40, except if you put the conditions minus 40, of course. But uh, you see here, uh, there is no need to rush you know, for, for the banks. They may be used as a funding instrument, but in terms of supporting lending for the time being, it's not the, pr the, the primary purpose. It's something we, we keep. We are aware, of course, of the slowdown of the economy, of the downside risk that we flagged. So that instruments can be uh, designed and calibrated in a proper way when times come. And that's a little bit what we have now. So the fact that the take up for the, S the September, it's far away, huh? but for the September allotment is not a major issue there uh, because that's more funding device. The question will be how you price it and, uh, and what are the conditions of the pricing. But that will depend on the assessment of the governing council about the lending conditions in general. Now we've talked about the risks to the economy. We've talked about what you've done so far and what's in the pipeline. Um, but if the Eurozone was heading for a recession, if the situation deteriorates significantly, what's actually left for the ECB to do? We don't like to speak too much about, you know, the, the toolbox. There are many questions about the toolbox, and I say, oh, what is this mysterious, you know, toolbox and all that? Because once you start, you know, talking about something, you know, you get a lot of speculative, you know, uh, attitudes, you know, and, and speculation about what you'll do and how far you're going to use. You just say in the past we always could show that when we need to do something within our mandate, we find a ways to do that. I think more realistically. Uh, the situation which is more in probabilistic term is an economy that would not recover you know, in the coming quarters because that's our scenario and basically what you would see is, a, is an increase of credit spreads, you would see some impairment you know, in the lending conditions, you know, the standards would tighten and there the appropriate instruments are uh, for example the Teltro and uh, how the central bank can influence lending conditions. That's how, how the tiering discussions came back to see if at some point the conditions evolve in such a way that you see some impairments in the lending part or on the corporate bond markets, then the central bank may you know, wish to use some of these instruments. And, and that's the context. Speculating about the big crisis, I think that's something I, I don't want to do. Is QE uh, still a possible tool? Well, we say that all uh, instruments are available, even new instruments, I can say, are available. QE is, of course, available, as we say, uh, but I think it's, it's need needless. <coughs> all the instruments are available, as we say, even new instruments are possible, but I think it's, uh, it's not the time to speculate about this. You are looking back to eight years at the ECB, um, and I am just wondering, what was your worst possible day on the job? I don't, I mean, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a worst day at the ECB, really. Uh, I, 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 I thought about these things, you know, now that I'm reaching the end. I, I had difficult days that, yes, sometimes, because, you know, in the sovereign debt crisis, I wouldn't say a worst day. You know, what helps very much in, uh, in, in, in difficult circumstances, and I, I must not complain, it's, uh, it's basically when you work in a group, in a team, I mean, it, it makes a whole difference. And I, I must say, uh, the, I, I had it all my life, you know, also in the banking crisis in Belgium. I mean, it was sometimes extremely stressful. When you are in a team, it, it changes totally the situation, at least for me. And so I cannot speak about the worst day. If, if you really push, us, push me to think about the worst day, I would immediately say when there was more uh, less unity, you see, that, that these are the, the situations where the stress goes up because you don't feel, you know, uh, that the team is disunited. But I, I don't, I, 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 well, I don't see that really as a worse day because, I mean, the, the team was in general, the team that means the governing council, was a very strong, even for those having different opinions. There was a sense of, of unity in general in the council, believe it or not, but that's how I feel it. Now, your successor is already known, Philip Lane from Ireland. Any preference as to who will replace Mario Draghi? <laughs> no, I mean, I have nothing to say on this. It was a fantastic, you know, cooperation with, uh, with Mario, uh, but uh, that's for the others, that's for the politicians to decide.